Blast Live. We're talking about what you're talking about. Real, honest, entertaining, live. DBL starts right now. Three, two. Thank you, David. Welcome to DBL. It's Thursday, July 22nd. I'm Tori here with Lindsay and Al. You look great, and I love your pink pants. 
Brooks. Well, thank you. Oh, I didn't Stand even up and see him. Yeah. You look like you should be in Martha's that's Vineyard right now. I, I know. I should very, very Martha's Vineyard desk. Very cute. <laughs> yeah. Love it. All right. We are less 24 hours away from uh, which camera I'm at? The opening ceremony at the Tokyo Games. But it's a new day, and with that, a new controversy. <laughs> the director of the opening ceremony was fired after a skit of his resurfaced from 1998. Now, in the skit, he was pretending to be a children's entertainer and said, quote, Let's play Holocaust. Cool. So he was fired. Uh, the guy before him was also fired for saying that women are not or shouldn't be in meetings because they talk too much. Not a great start to the Tokyo Games to make a Holocaust joke. Whether or not it was in the past, I think we all know that's wrong. Right. I think that some of this stuff is so long ago, it still is wrong and egregious, but like, why are the, is the combing through not done much before they hire somebody? Right. It's like I'm tired of seeing these things from even five years ago. That's like, oh, someone else found this and now they're making it public and now we retract everything that we've already done. Like, how about just hire a competent team that hires someone like to vet, right? To vet. It's like it, people it, should, do it that. doesn't seem like it should be that tough. If any yeah. random pedestrian can find some of these these things that are tweeted out and said in people's past, then it seems like a team that's hire, competent like, could do that. A 16 year old hacker. They could figure it out. Let me ask you guys a more difficult question. What if he says I've evolved my thoughts in the last 23 years? You can't make a Holocaust joke in my mind. I'm, I'm just I'm obviously with this, but I think that there's going to be more nuanced situations. And, I, you, you know, for us, you, I always say I'm happy that I had kind of one foot in the analog world and one in the digital and that I was around really before the internet. How old does that sound? But I don't think that your child will have the same luxury. Everything she says Everything that she does that she may be embarrassed about that's recorded by a friend when she's 12 will be recorded forever. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is going to be a, a, a problem that we're so easily able to work through as something as egregious as this. Right. Well, it's accountability at some point. Well, that's why I leave a little bit of a more space for people that were 18 or under. Mm -hmm. I think every time you have this conversation, it's tough because whether it's about race or about identity in any way, I think it's always extremely that's offensive. Fair. But when you're younger than 18, I know that we all said things, maybe not racist things, that we would take back before 18. Yes. And you learn as an adult through college, or even if you don't go to college, you learn as an adult what to do and what not to do. And so I think when you have adults saying stuff like this, it's different um, because that's your thought process as a grown, yeah. fully developed human. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, you don't make jokes about that. All right, speaking of the opening ceremonies, a lot of people are wondering, what's it going to look like? So here's what one of the NBC's hosts had to say about it on the Today Show. Take a look. This is a different celebration. We're celebrating the fact that we hope the world can get back to where we enjoyed it three, four years ago, pre-COVID-19. But it's also a serious time here. And I think what we'll see in that stadium will be something that's tone appropriate. It'll have its moments. Uh, every opening ceremony has those memorable moments. And I think there are a couple in store. Uh, but I do think it's the first chance to really see the world together in one place, 206 nations and delegations, since COVID-19 hit. That moment alone, just as we've talked about the last couple of days, that's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, there's also been a lot of talk about protesting at the year's summer games. Earlier this week, the U.S. women's soccer team took a knee during their game against Sweden. They are among five teams that have protested. So Sweden also took the knee. Uh, Great Britain, Chile, New Zealand, all these soccer teams took the knee. And they said specifically, and I think it's important to talk about this, it's to protest racism and online hate. And during the Euro games, we saw an incredible, incredible amount of racism against three of the uh, black players that you saw and uh, they're really trying to cut down on that and that's why they took the knee what do you guys think I mean you always talk about how important it is for people to use their platform to kind of say what they're trying to say and I think that over COVID you also talked about how everybody came together and we all supported nurses but we saw a lot of ugliness especially people of color really got to share that light with other people to show what their day-to-day -day life looks like mm. because we were all sitting in the house and sitting in front of our phones and watching what people experience and so I think that they're using this time because we waited so long for the Olympics to come back around I think that they're using this platform in the same way it's just the same message as last year mm. except now it's their time to share how they were feeling last year mm, that's interesting what do you think yeah I think that we need to remember that we're dealing with human beings on both sides because there are people watching the games that will say I don't want to see this I want to see a, a soccer match that's that's a fair statement but they have to understand also that there's a human beings on that team and the uh, the German uh, this wasn't part of the Olympics but a German team uh, left the field left the game while it was still going 
because uh, three of their black players are being abused so badly by the fans. And they have to understand that just like that team is standing up for the people in their tribe that they right. love, we would do the same thing here. If there was an issue where somebody was attacking the women here, uh, the uh, people that identify however they identify here, we wouldn't just be like, well, let's just do the show. We'd be like, we're a family. Yeah. So uh, we love you guys as our viewers, but it's, we're going to protect the family. Tribe, and, we're right. gonna, and, and I should hope our viewers will feel the same about their tribe. Now, I will say that this, some people feel like maybe this isn't the best place to do it, right? Like, I don't want to see that. I just want to see sports. And I just want to let you know, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, they've relaxed Rule 50. I just want to let everyone know here, which barred political, religious, or racial propaganda. They are now going to allow for demonstrations peaceful to happen before the setups and the games. They didn't before. Good? Is that a good move? Do you think that's possible? Positive in that way because you're getting some of that but without mixing it with the games people always say that about sports and entertainment that they don't want to see politics involved but sports and sports like stars and athletes have been some of the biggest people to make statements and then get a whole legion of people to follow them or understand who wasn't watching like mm. a political 24-hour news channel and so I think that that's odd to say that you don't want people to be human beings like Al just said because everybody's not just an athlete we learned that with LeBron people yeah. have thoughts and feelings and so they need they're allowed to use that space that they've been given at the highest level of achievement to share their other thoughts as well well said if you want to look at a good example Muhammad Ali is in exact that position Real random question for viewers to think about though how will they feel if they don't agree with what that person is saying like let's say that somebody is a men's rights activist right right or a white lives matter right. activist do if they do they get the same leniency yeah, if you're having a peaceful protest you can't believe in freedom of speech if you only believe in the speech that you like I just think you like, have to but an activist is not somebody that's not fighting for an oppressed group so what are you an activist about like if you're talking about white lives matter you know that's kind of like a, a little bit of a well you know or, I'm a staunch white lives no matter. I'm just saying like <laughs> that's not, that, that would be a little bit different I think because then you're you're being a little bit racist, knowing the history of our country and many other countries represented at the Olympics. Yeah, but I think a lot of times things like that are used to kind of just needle back, you know, or push back. Let us know what you guys think. There's a very new controversial billboard in Times Square in New York City. This is what it says. Ready? It says feeling fat and lazy and shows a plus sized woman in athletic gear sitting down with her head in her hands. It also shows a very fit woman plugging her workout site. Now, the billboard is getting a bunch of criticism, including from Jamila Jamil. She says this is a blatantly fat phobic and also quite ableist ad. It bothers me to no end that we are still yet to recognize cruelty and offense to fat people as hate speech. Now, Deborah Capacho is the woman who's pretty fit and perky. Now, she said, quote, this is her response, yeah, I expected some backlash. She was provoking, but I'm more disturbed by today's culture where anything that causes discomfort of dissonance is considered taboo. So she is unapologetic about the billboard. And may I just say very quickly, fat and lazy don't go together. Lazy is a feeling, fat is something in your body, and those two are unrelated, and I don't think those two should go together. Go ahead, Lindsay. Is that her own story? I just wanted, like, a... She says it's what she says in her voice, and a lot of people say that's what's in my voice, but we get that voice from the billboards that we're seeing every day. I mean, I think if she had the money to put that billboard up there, then you can do whatever you want. But I also think that, you know, obviously we have to have a conversation about what the standards are. When I go to the doctor, I've been overweight my entire life. And if you looked at me any other time besides when I was pregnant and carrying a kid, you would say I look like a healthy size. And I think I was a pretty healthy individual. But BMI and all the things that we judge it by say that I'm overweight. So I don't really know. I just think yeah. how offensive is this allowed when I, there's nothing about like, if, it, about other people's, problems but it's so okay to be fattest i don't even know if that's a word to be like fat and lazy go together you feel like this do you feel awful why is that allowed i think it's as not past, a hate speech I, I think it's simpler than it being offensive it's a poor ad it seems outdated it looks like we're an talking ad about it from the 90s but we're talking about it because it's provoking it's such us. a poor ad i would i, I just but think she's that provoking us on purpose if she had somebody else in her ear she would know that that's not how you communicate to people that are trying to lose weight uh, our, my co-host Jeff and I, we talk all the time about like, oh, what are you doing? I don't go, Jeff, you're not fat anymore. I'm fat. Like, people don't communicate like that anymore. We've, we've, uh, but up, Al, we've she's upped our verbal game and we don't discuss agreed, things like that, so it, it seems outdated. But she knew that and purposely did that, so we're talking about it. Not a bad idea for someone to get attention. I just think it's a really offensive ad. Let us know your thoughts. We'll be right back. Closed captioning provided by... <laughs> Thank you.
According to studies, we're lied to between 20 and 200 times on any given day. But what constitutes a lie? If I tell you I'm fine when I'm not, is that a lie? Is there a way to detect deception? I'm William Shatner, and I don't understand. Hi there, DBL Nation. It's Kelly Schubert here with the DBL Digital Team. It is Thursday. We call that Friday Junior around here. Let's go to the desk and continue the conversation with our host. Hi, guys. Really? Yeah. Hey, hey, what's going on? Hey, How are you feeling today? today? I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, you're First fine. of all, we all like your glasses. Let's all just I do call it out. Cover that. Let's Let's just call it out. It reminds me of, and I know what, a lot of people have different feelings about Wendy Williams, but when she picks up her glasses to read them, yes. she probably doesn't even need. That's what I feel like this is this small. Yeah, can I tell you the truth? These are fake. I don't need them. She always tells the truth. Always <laughs> I have LASIK. Like, I do not need these glasses. But you I just like to change beautiful. up my style a little bit. I'm a little tired today. I didn't get enough sleep, so I just... Boop. They look like smart look. I do want to ask a question for you guys and following up on what we were talking about. It is really hard when the freedom of speech that you want is something that you are so antithetical or against in your heart, and you still have to allow for that speech because to have a lane. Speech, yeah. Because it, and that is incredibly difficult. We talked about that over Facebook when you know a lot of the different groups were being able to speak. Yeah, um, but they would shut down. Yep. Like they shut down Farrakhan, but wouldn't shut down a lot of people that were saying white supremacist things. Right, right, right. And so it's just like, when does freedom of speech lead to violence or hate speech? Right, or and then that speech. changes from freedom of speech yeah. to. The COVID thing was called a hoax for a long time. Yep. It was in the, the vaccines were then questioned for a long time. And now we have a little less than half this country is unvaccinated. And this, this variant is really bad, really, really bad. bad. You want to know something so, interesting real quick? First person to write me that says I agree with you about the mandate for the first time. I'm not I'm not saying it'll happen, but it's interesting to see people maybe, maybe. DBL Nation, let us know what you think. We'll see you soon. Bye. Welcome back to DBL. Seven-year-old, let me say that again, seven-year-old Molly Wright is reportedly the youngest girl to ever give a TED Talk. And she has a very important message for parents. It's incredible. Take a look. I know it's important for adults to use their devices sometimes, but kids are hardwired to seek out meaningful connections. Not receiving them causes confusion and stress. Okay, I'm a jot. Please re-engage. <laughs> now, what if a whole childhood was like that last 30 seconds? Interesting. Now, you are about to be a parent. You are a parent causing a problem devices in your life. Let's be honest here. Are you addicted and not paying attention? I'm are you not. worried? Yeah, Lindsay, I'm going to talk to you. You're the future mama. Well, my first thought besides that was that I want my kid to act exactly like this. <laughs> like, I'm just like, listen, I was never the cool kid in school. Like, please go to all the science fairs. Please read all the Amen. books. Do all the TED Talks Amen. at seven. This is my dream kid. Now, well I don't know spoken. what my kid's going to act like because I was a little bit bad as well, but I wasn't cool. So this I don't, this is really cool to me, but not cool in the eyes of just like, you know. I think it's cool. How, how kids treat each other in school. They're probably like, you did a TED Talk. <laughs> Cool. Um, but I think, yeah, no, the devices are hard because I even had to sit down with my mom and my sister. We've been at the table and my mom has just been like, you are so rude. Like with your, on your oh, phone, she's like both of us are texting and she's just sitting there like staring at us. And so I really had to like put my phone, I do this now when I go to dinner and like um, when Colin's daughter, Michaela spends time with us, we, we put our phones away, we eat dinner together. And so I think it's important to, yes, yeah, set aside some time. And then also a lot of our work is digital. So I think we're going to be on our computers a lot, but make sure that each time is separated appropriately yeah I, th I think a lot of adults would say the same thing they'd be like I agree with your message but you know I, I literally run my business mm. that allows for this home for this child to be in through my job and this isn't 1954 work doesn't end at five o'clock anymore when you come down and put your briefcase down that's those days are over so it is difficult for parents I just hope because I, I, I think this young woman has such a great message that people just uh, 
don't neglect what she's saying because of her age. Uh, I think we have a tendency to look down on yeah, younger generations right. that try and say anything, even though they are really not only the future, but they really probably have a better grasp on what is coming next than we do. Absolutely. Like I said, my daughter told me about TikTok four years before oh, it hit, yeah. and I didn't listen because I'm, I'm like, what does she know? She's nine. Turns out a lot. TikTok? <laughs> what is this yes. TikTok? Talk. I was like, what a dumb name. Yeah, right. And I think it's okay to set boundaries. Like, no, I'm going home. We have a time. basket. My mom has a basket. We put our phones in that basket, and the first person to touch the basket pays for the meal. Ooh, well, I'm, I'll be putting my phone in the basket. <laughs> 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 I've got an extra cash right now. Coming up on DVL, a man runs across America from California to New York. What did he do to make every single mile count on his journey? I'd be exhausted. Attention. <laughs> Mammograms are an essential way to screen for breast cancer, but the Centers for Disease Control says there was an 87% drop in tests in April 2020 as the pandemic began compared to the monthly averages of the five previous Aprils. As patients start to feel comfortable returning to the doctor's office and more people get vaccinated, Verify viewer Mydea asks, can the COVID-19 vaccine lead to a false positive mammogram? Our sources are the Society for Breast Imaging, Johns Hopkins University, Kaiser Permanente, and the American Cancer Society, which says one of the side effects of the vaccine is swollen lymph nodes under the arm where you got the injection. Kaiser explains the swelling is a natural response as your body's immune system makes antibodies and trains your cells to protect you. However, Lisa Mullen, a radiologist at Johns Hopkins, says that lymph node swelling can make a mammogram look abnormal. In most cases, doctors will do more testing to confirm what's happening. So it's true. The COVID-19 vaccine can lead to a false positive mammogram. Despite this, the Society of Breast Imaging recommends women still get their vaccine and then schedule a mammogram at least four weeks after their second dose. It also suggests not waiting if they're overdue or have symptoms. This isn't unique to the COVID-19 vaccine either. Mullen says vaccines for the flu, pneumonia, shingles, and tetanus can also swell lymph nodes. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. to DBL. Hella Sadibe's love of running is monumental. I mean, he's been running every day for four years and he recently went coast to coast. Earlier, I spoke with Hella about what it was like to run across America. That's today's DBL Spotlight. Hella, welcome to DBL. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So you've been running every single day for four years now, but I know you have to take at least yes. one day off, right? I mean, what if you don't feel well or something? I haven't missed a day since um, May 15th of 2017. No matter the circumstances, that's always the matter for me. I admire you. I want to be just like you. So you completed a transcontinental run. And for those who may not know what that means, that means you went from the West Coast and you ran through 14 states. And this is awesome, having family, people you love that are here to support and do stuff that they normally don't do just for you. So what was your favorite state Correct. that you passed through? New Mexico is beautiful, not just because of the scene, but the people in there, the Navajo reservation. So you meeting the natives was one of the most beautiful things to experience. People are supporting you, you're getting water handed out to you. And the, the story travels really quick. You'll meet somebody in one part of the state, by the time a couple days later, they're like, oh, we we're expecting you. We're, we're expecting you to come through and then they'll make you gifts. They're looking out for you while you're going through their reservation. They want you to have nothing but a positive experience. So you've seen the best of America, but likely some of the worst too. Last year, Ahmad Arbery was killed while running. Were you ever scared for your life during your transcontinental run? One of them was uh, running in Oklahoma. When we met police officers that were like cheering you on and they're like, oh, we saw you on Instagram and TikTok, we wanna say hi. So I had the same expectation as I saw this officer coming toward me. So me being me, I'm excited. I'm like, yes, there's another one. And I'm excited to meet them. And when I got close to him, it, it got serious really quick. And the energy that I was getting from him, I didn't think it was good because immediately he said, what are you doing out here? Why are you running? 
I got a phone call because people would call the police on us often. And what scared me right away was when the officer put his hand on his gun and kind of like clipped that, hold the gun down. And I got really nervous. I started panicking, showing my trekking for my running pole. I said, hey, I'm just running across the country. This is the pole I'm using to help me on hills. It's not like to show him it's not a weapon. So he started asking for my license, my birthday. I said, I sent my RV five miles ahead. But what helped the situation is I saw two white couples far ahead. I knew they were waiting for me. So they got impatient. They came in and say, hey, we're trying to look out for you. Our son told us you're going to be here. We want to donate. And the officer started believing the story. When I was telling him, he wasn't buying it. Wow, Hella, I'm so sorry that you had to go through those experiences. But hopefully, like you said, there was more positive than negative, And you just kept exactly. running and kept doing your thing. Yes. You always run for a purpose. You also have a $50,000 fundraising Correct. goal for the organization Soul for Souls. Why did you choose that organization? Correct. I picked Souls for Souls, which is a nonprofit that collects unwanted shoes. Use are new and they turn into opportunity. And their goal is to break the, the cycle of poverty. I grew up in West Africa, Mali, where I know how a pair of shoes can go a long way. We don't have shoes to wear. Sometimes if you have a pair of shoes, you got to take care of it for two to three years or five. If you don't, you don't know where your next one is coming from. It was very relatable. And I thought even uh, uh, all you need is a good pair of shoes to go on a run. So I thought it was a perfect combination for me to go out there and dedicate the runs to everybody that's doing the work to help people around the world. Thank you so much for joining DBL and thank you for all that you're doing. And to our DBL Nation, to learn more about Hella's running journey, check out his YouTube page and help him reach his fundraising goal. Visit justgiving.com slash fundraising slash Hella Good. We'll be right back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Promotional consideration is brought to you by The start of football season is less than two months away, and many fans are eager to watch their teams from the stands once again. Verify viewer Ralph asked, will any team require fans to be vaccinated to enter the stadium? So Ralph, let's verify. Our sources are the NFL, multiple teams, and their stadiums. Last season, stadiums operated with limited capacity or used cardboard cutouts to fill the stand. Not the same as a packed house cheering for a fourth quarter comeback. This year, the NFL's game ticket policy makes no mention of a vaccine requirement. Instead, there's a health promise that asks unvaccinated fans to not attend if they have symptoms or were told to quarantine. Teams, stadiums, and local health officials can also make their own rules. Some teams, like the Saints, Giants, and 49ers, have already said they won't require vaccines. The same goes for the stadiums that host the Patriots and Panthers. The Buffalo Bills were originally told they would need to only open to vaccinated fans, but Erie County Executive Mark Polakars changed his stance after a decline in COVID-19 cases, saying the county would only require vaccines if circumstances warrant it. So it's false that NFL teams will require vaccines when games kick off in September. Of course, rules can change as it gets closer to game time. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis.
Welcome back to DBL. It's time for some sweet, sweet deals. Earlier, Steph showed me some amazing products at even better prices. Here's this week's DBL Deal Blast, presented by MorningSave.com. All right, Steph, what do you have for us today? First up, I've got something that will go great with anyone's skin routine. This is the Glossmetics Lux 4-in-1 Sonic Facial Cleansing and Exfoliating Set. So this tool gently removes hard to reach dirt, makeup and debris, leaving nothing but smooth, soft and glowing skin. So normally this is as much as $130, oh. but now it's only $20. For everything? Yes, yes, yes. Saving our viewers up to 85%. Now, Tori, have you ever found yourself, you're waiting around at the nail salon, and it's 30 to 40 minutes to get your nails done, and then it's expensive, it's and you feel so like you're paying a lot. Yeah. Well, this is the answer. It's the Double Dip Nail Dip Powder Starter Set. It's as simple as coat, dip, file, and shine. Whoa. And the best part about this set is there was no animal testing, and it's cruelty-free. Oh, I love that. So normally it's as much as $90. Oh, a little pricey for my blood. It is pricey, but we've got it for only $35, <laughs> saving up to 61%. Next up, I've got something to help you get organized and get to cooking. Ooh. It's the Cook With Color four-piece nesting bowl set, and it comes with a two-piece wish set and dishwasher and freezer safe. Nice. But normally, this is as much as $50. Okay. Um, but we've got it for only 20, saving our viewers 60%. Oh. And last but not least, I've got something that will step your summer garden or backyard up a notch. It is the eight pack in ground solar pathway lights with bright LEDs. So the bright LEDs are sustainable and switch on in the dark and turn off oh, in wow. the daylight. Normally it's as much as $60. Ooh, that hurts. We've got them for only $29. <laughs> 52%. Honestly, great, great, great products. Head on over to MorningSave.com to snag these amazing deals at the lowest prices. You could even visit MorningSave.com on your smartphone. Thank you so much, Steph. I really can't wait. I want to light up my backyard with those. Do it. All right. DBL's new every day. We'll see you same time, same place tomorrow. Light it up.